Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Second in Command podcast. My name is Timothy Simons. I am joined by Matt Walsh. Yeah. Wait, who'd you play? I forgot to do the who'd you play. I played Jonah Ryan on the television. Does it really matter? I, don't, I feel like we're going to need to change this. I played Mike, the press secretary. Okay. <laughs> but I feel like anybody who listens, unless you're a first time listener, no discredit to you, first timers. No, I think there is something that is a. I think there is something nice about the familiarity of the same thing. Intro. Be, you know what I mean? Yeah, the same. It's like the opening credits to a sitcom. It's just the same every year. Yeah, and people are like, it, it's like they're like, oh, if, if they're excited about it, then they hear the thing happening. And it's like, all right, here we go. You know what I mean? But maybe I'm overvaluing intro. Well, do you think it's less appropriate for some episodes when we don't necessarily unpack an episode and we just like, Sometimes we just go off on tangents that have nothing to do with Veep. And then sometimes we, like today, we're not really going to cover an episode. So that's maybe what I'm vibing. It's like sometimes I feel like less, I feel restrained by the description of I played Mike McClintock, which makes me an authority on this episode we are going to deconstruct. When in fact, we're not going to do that today. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Maybe it's like if it's not going to be directly related we won't talk about who we played maybe that's like the the running theme we for not a gonna... little bit or yeah. i'm just sharing i'm just sharing why i wasn't psyched about it today but sometimes <laughs> sometimes you still got to show up to work even when you don't feel like showing up to work so. yeah i uh, i want to fill you in uh we were going to record this a little bit so uh walsh is back so for if you're watching you can see that walsh is back in his home um uh, which means he's on the West Coast. Uh, I had just finished a job that was shooting in Las Vegas. And so, uh, and also my son was in like his first play. Like he is like, um, which was really exciting. It went really well. He loved it. Um, so I finished, like I wrapped work in Las Vegas at like 2 a.m., 3 a.m. on Saturday morning. No, Sunday morning, like Saturday into Sunday. And I was getting out. I was going to fly back really early to make sure I got to the matinee, like the closing night. We were the closing show, which was yesterday uh, on on Sunday. And so uh, I when I wrapped at like 3 a.m., I was like, well, fuck it. The car's picking me up at like four o'clock to go to the airport. So, you know what I mean? At that point, it's just like everybody like kind of went to the production office, had a drink. You know, it was like the very last night of the production. So everybody was done. Everybody was wrapped. So I was like, fuck it. I went and I just stayed up. I got in the car. It's like a 45 minute flight. I slept for 45 minutes, got back to the house. Caught Can I ask you a question? Yes. What number were you on the call sheet? I just want to see how excited people were to see you at this soft wrap. What was your number on the oh, call sheet? Well, show? here's the thing. I think that I, I, mean, I was number 13. Okay. But I think, I, I think my general, uh, my, you know, I, I was I think that they greeted me with more excitement than 13. OK, but, you know, also subdued in that I had not been around for like the entire two months. You know what I mean? OK, yeah, they treated me more like a 13, but not like a three. Okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's, I think, yeah, three to eight. You're in the sweet spot. You yes, know? I, I, I really do feel like they made There's no difference like, between three and eight, nine. Yeah. Yeah, they made me feel like I was a three to eight, even though I was okay. a 13. Great. So okay. uh, it was great. I uh, caught like a few hours of sleep once I got back to the house. But then we had to like get up and get Marty to the play. Uh, and then I helped out. The play was like four hours long. Oh, my uh, God. It's like an insanely long play. It was really good. Uh, definitely could have used some editing. But, you know, that but it still was really good. Very proud of him then helped with the strike and then we went to the cast party in which it was a really beautiful thing the director said like a, a really wonderful thing about every single kid involved in the production and then there were like 14 seniors because it's like a youth theater for the neighborhood it's not connected to a school so the kids are kind of from all over and there were like 14 seniors that have been like doing plays with this theater group for you know since they were like nine so like this director has known them since for you know for nine years ten years so it was like seeing them grow up 
So he said like a really heartfelt thing about every single person that was involved. And it was really beautiful. And then he gave out awards. Uh, but it went until like 1 a.m. Like it Ooh. took so long. So I was on like, I, I had been awake for essentially like 40 hours and was like at 1 a.m. was just like absolutely like my brain was just fucking mush. Wow. And so that's why this all comes down to like we were going to we were had a little plan to go down to Long Beach, hang out with the family. And then we just like absolutely called it just like, no, we're not going anywhere. Yeah. That's a good holiday, though, not doing anything. I It's kind of nice to just relax. Yeah. Kids, yeah. You know, riding bikes around a little bit uh marty who was in the play like he was up till 1 a.m so like he just we just let him sleep in you know now he's going to run some errands it's like a lazy day it's kind of fun yeah yeah we had a lazy memorial day too i uh i put my flag out i like putting my flag out on memorial day um but i couldn't find morgan installed a flag holder like a hard mount uh-huh and you would think it'd be easy and obvious to find we have two pillars <laughs> I couldn't again I couldn't find it so I end up taping it to the fence like it's really kind of like white trash taped to the fence and I think it's still yeah it's still standing sometimes Wait, where is Morgan well when she got home I forgot to ask her because Emmett's like dad let's just because I started taping it and Emmett was helping me and he's like dad let's just wait till mom gets home and then we'll ask her where's the the flag mount because it's buried in the plants or so, it's on one of the posts but okay you, it's like anchored into two of the posts that are on our front driveway basically yeah and the posts are kind of covered in plant life like ivy so you would think it'd be easy to find but neither one of us could find it that's incredible i love that yeah. like if the tape falls that the flag's going to be upside down it's going to be like sam alito flying the upside down <laughs> january 6th flag like accidentally everybody's going to be like matt walsh supports january 6th it's a distress signal, isn't it, when you fly it upside down? I'm yeah. not sure. All I know is that it was somehow flying it upside down was related to the January 6th attacks at the time. And have have you seen that story about Sam Alito's wife or he blamed it on his wife? Yeah, I did yeah. see that. Yeah. But I know like when we went to the Fort McHenry where the Star Spangled Banner was written, I think we learned that when you put the flag upside down, you're signaling to your allies that you're in distress, like you're under attack or there's something like happen. It's like military communication as well. I could see that being sort of bastardized to, yeah. be, to be used by like the people yeah. who stormed the Capitol. I could see that being like, you know, the country's in distress. Yes. Our country, our way of living is yeah. being taken over by the left. Yeah. hundred percent. But uh, no, made some sun tea, which I get excited about. Oh, I love that. And it turned it into an Arnold Palmer, juiced some lemons, made an Arnold, big jug of Arnold Palmer. Oh, dude, this is the I dream. Made some pancakes. Cece had a sleepover, so I said made some pancakes for the girls and then made some burgers for lunch for Emmy and whoever else. And you, then are, you just described like the Memorial Day American dream. Like you honored the troops. You spent time with your family. You made a iced tea and juice beverage, like a lot of it so that everybody could enjoy. What a day. And then I made a smoothie because I'm trying to eat more vegetables and fruit. So I made a smoothie and it wasn't great. It was like, it was a mix of like berries and then like alfalfa sprouts and cucumber. And they just didn't, the marriage was not good. You know? No, okay. Yeah, I could see and that. They were competing. So I, I made too much. So I gave a big bowl of it to the chickens oh nice yeah so i fed the chickens a smoothie and i think they ate it or drank can it i tell it. you one of my favorite stories about my mom please there was so the last, listening uh, i mean you know she's gonna be listening yeah uh so when we went back to visit my family last summer uh, I was I was over at my mom and dad's house and I found like a big bag of like scrap food in the freezer. And I was like, Mom, uh, what is this for? And she was like, oh, whenever I have leftover food, I just put it all in a bag because my little brother, they have chickens too. my my brother and his wife and, and their their kids. They have they have like a bunch of chickens and stuff. So 
she was like, I just, you know, I, I, I freeze it and then I give it to Dan uh, so that he can feed the chickens. And there was this pause and she looked at me and she said, sometimes I put a little cookie in there so that they can have a treat. <laughs> and it made me laugh so hard that like the I mean like I feel like the leftover food is a treat enough for the chickens I don't know that they're going to be able to delineate oh I think they like no I, I think your mom's right I think animals like sugar like Cece had a sleepover last night and when I was out here in this guest house your garagey thing uh there was a half an eaten cupcake and I gave it to the chickens they liked it I think they loved it. Yeah, it's gone. Okay, unless, cool. the, unless the squirrels come in, the squirrels are like the snipers. They come in and do what they want. So I wasn't there to witness it. But I think animals like sugar. Like even dogs will eat sugar over like, maybe not over steak, but over like kibble. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, cool. Well, your my mom is going to be very glad that you guys see eye to eye on this. <laughs> and uh, I get like, treating them like a pet. It's cute. Yeah. Uh, so we're just going to do a quick, uh, cause it's Memorial day. And again, like if any of you've been like listening in the last few weeks, the scheduling has been really hard. Um, so we hope to be back on track, uh, next week, either with an episode about beginning with season seven, cause we had the transition episode with Dave last week. So either we're going to be doing season seven, or if we can get on it, you wanted to talk about the book. We're going to try to get Billy Kimball in to talk about the book. Well, David Mandel, our number one listener, uh, was saying we need to get Billy Kimball on and talk about the book. And I'd never listened to the book, let alone read it, even though Mike wrote it, my character. And the book is really funny. It's so like she spends like 15 minutes doing like forward acknowledgement, prologue, like and then she finally gets into chapter one and she's always like, Jesus Christ, I'm not even into the fucking book yet. Like, what is Mike doing? Like, there's all that going on. And then, oh, like, so she's commenting on oh, the book as she leaves grips. Like, she's like, we're going to have to cut this out. Nobody cares about footnotes. And she's like, I can't wear, I can't read footnotes anymore. Gary, read the footnotes. And she's like, what is this asterisk or Christ on a cross sign? She's like, and he's like, oh, it's an, it's an acknowledgement or footnote. He's like, you read it. So every time there's a footnote, she'll go, uh, cross sign Gary and then Gary will, will read the footnote and then they'll continue and then she always goes anytime there's a quotes or parentheses she will talk it you know quote end quote parentheses end parentheses like it's so annoyingly not good intentionally like she does all the wrong things to make it not entertaining it's really good and then <laughs> they go into her family history because the Eatons, she's an Eaton. They came over on the second boat after the Mayflower. So they weren't the first wave of Blue Bloods. And then her, her great-grandfather, her lineage, was a suspected scoundrel who stole the real Eaton's name and got on the boat and then was, like, showing his penis to the women on the boat and, like, threw, oh some, my people God. Over, threw some people overboard and was, like, just the worst human being ever. I mean, this sounds, number one, this sounds incredible. I can't believe I haven't listened to it or read it. I know. I mean, this is the thing. I feel like I brought this up before. Like, like we've talked a lot about the writers uh, on this show. And, like, the, the, the general knowledge that you just have to have, like, your American history knowledge, like, Billy's knowledge, uh, like, it's, what is, what is he going to be able to do? Sit down and research for years to write that book like no I think Dave was just like hey you want to write a book and Billy was like sure and he just knew enough all right this is exciting I'm really excited to do this book episode oh it's great and I'll just give you another teaser I know we won't cover the book today but like she gets and then they go into Andrew's uh side of the family which were like Ashkenazi Jews who moved around to Europe and then I think they settled in America selling somewhat radioactive medicines oh my god and then she talks about her first love and she basically stalked a guy for a year and then she gets into this sex moment and she's like i gotta go to the bathroom so then gary has to read all the sex stuff <laughs> <laughs> and he's like i don't know if like i don't know if i can do this he's like oh mm -hmm. uh ooh. <laughs> it's really good that's so, so 
there is there are like two levels of the joke like if you're re if you're just reading the book i'm assuming the passages themselves are just really funny yeah like the actual just words yeah. on the page are funny but the second level of jokes of selena made gary read that in the yeah and then she'll always have every every paragraph or two she'll have sides like no I, I don't want this in the book people don't need to know that like when they talk about the bad people in her lineage She's like, we, we're going to have to cut some of that out. People don't need to know that. And then she'll go back to the script. It's really good. Oh, that's That rules. Um, uh, so to everyone can look forward to that. Today, we are going to be doing a little bit of a mailbag episode. So I've compiled some uh, questions from both uh, Second in Command, ATC at gmail.com. People who have sent in, some of these have been from a while ago. And for, and for that, I apologize. Um, and also like throughout on... Uh, the Instagram page today, like ask us some questions. Uh, so I think I've got a few. Do you want me to start going through? Yeah. And I just want to say that um, I did my work for this episode today and I asked chat GPT that I'm going to be talking to Tim Simons today, interviewing him and what, what might be some good questions to ask to inspire conversation. So I did a lot of research for today's show too. Wow. That's really good job. It's a tool. Um, it's not going to replace us. It's a tool. Uh, well, why don't we, do you want to alternate this first question? Why don't you, I'll go first. And then uh, why don't you uh, throw out one of the chat GPT ones after that? Uh, this is one of the first ones that came up from Instagram from uh, Jumping Jehovah's. Don't know what their real name. Oh, Alex. Alex is their real name. Uh, what, if anything about your character, would you have changed and why? I think... One of the things that sometimes when I watch, I wish I would have pushed a little back on making sure Mike was at least decent at his job sometimes. Yeah. You know, it's a, sometimes the jokes make him clownish, which is fine. But sometimes I do like, but it's not like a true regret, but it's like a soft regret, I guess. I yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's a hard thing. You always want to like, Oh, I don't know. I guess I've been thinking about this recently about like, as you get like, I don't know if you're like young or inexperienced or just starting out, like you kind of don't care. You'll do whatever. And, but so you want to like, it's, I think it's like maybe a, a hard balance to find of like, once you get more experience and you have an ability and, uh, and knowledge of how to balance things and how to find the right balance you don't want to go too hard toward i'm not going to do that or i don't think that's going to work because you want to honor the people that you work with you want to honor their ideas but also still protect it's like a hard balance to find it is and it's also for me it's stressful to introduce those things sometimes because i probably avoid conflict or whatever my personality is such but it's like it is a tough role because like in comedy at the end of the day, you're just trying to play something that's as funny as possible. And like, nobody cares about the diary of your character or nobody cares that your character had a degree in law. Like ultimately you're in the scene. What's the funniest way to hold the cup? What's the funniest way to fall down? What's the funniest way to not hear a line? Like that's really all you're doing, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a tricky thing. How about you? Do you have something that you think like, or you think of, you know, no, I mean, I think maybe related, I, I, but this actually, I remember at one point talking uh, uh, to one of our guests who came on about how like in sitcoms, the longer that sitcoms go on in a way, like the stupider the characters have to become. Yeah. And that was something that he brought up. And, and I remember thinking like, oh, like, uh, and I do remember there was a joke in season seven that I think is a great joke. And uh, and I think it's in the very last scene that Jonah is in where uh, somebody says uh, EEOB, like meaning Eisenhower Executive uh, Office Building or OEB, o OEOB, meaning uh, old, old Eisenhower ex Office Building or whatever. And... And Jonah says, like, what the fuck is that? Like, uh, it's a funny joke. 
but he, I just think at some point, like I should have at the time maybe said, I mean, like, and I love the joke and it's funny, but I think it was one of those things where it was like, oh, he spent his entire life knowing every single little thing about the White House and the Eisenhower and all that. Like, that's something that he just would have known, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, but it definitely like and i guess in a way but it also did kind of play into where things went with him in that like he was so power hungry and he did get so stupid and he was so craven that yeah. it wasn't like it wasn't like insulting by any means it was just sort of like later i realized like oh we probably could have found another thing that would have achieved the same joke without going against that you know what i mean yeah, it's not like a core value where you had to like kill your mom because Jonah loves his mom, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, well, yeah. You could probably, yeah, come up with a better joke. But in the moment, it's like, I, I guess I could figure a way to play that. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Well, thank you for that question, Alex. Got that one from Instagram. Thank you. What do you got? Um who are who are some of your acting or comedy role models and how have they influenced your work? Oh, that's a really good question, Walsh. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I I honestly, like I have always said this, uh, I'll give you a sincere, I'll give ChatGPT a sincere answer. Please, uh, I'm interviewing Tim Simons today and I need to inspire conversation. Did, let me just ask this. Did ChatGPT like seem impressed at all? Like I'm trying to figure out where Chat GPT would put me on the call sheet. You know what I mean? Like for your, I think you're a three to nine for Chat GPT. Oh, okay. Oh, God. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think, cool. it's, I think it's in the algorithm that everybody is a three to nine, though. Unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you type in, I'm hanging out with Julia. I'm interviewing Julia today. It would immediately treat her like a one. It was like it, the, the algorithm knows that Julia is a one. Yeah. That that one. Yeah. That stands um, out. I, uh, God's Honest Truth is Steve Buscemi. Hi. Like, I've uh, like loved him since like, uh, you know, like Reservoir Dogs and the adventures of Pete and Pete and just watching so much of the stuff that he did coming up. Like when I was like, when I first really started getting into movies, um, uh, like uh, living in oblivion, like, I uh, Fargo, the guy is just somebody who, who can do anything he can be in anything he always seems like he fits and I just like I love the choices that he makes I think he's had an amazing career of like doing stuff that doing stuff that like you know like I don't think anybody can argue that like Con Air is like a, a masterpiece I mean it is a masterpiece um but like on paper you don't like look at that job and think, you know, Steve Buscemi's probably doing that for money and for a job. It's a big job and it allows him to do other artistic things, but you never get the sense that Steve Buscemi feels like he's above anything that he's doing. Like, like whether or not it turns out great is probably not ever going to be up to him. Uh, but it just, he just seems like a guy that every time he steps on set, he like, he's like, he's going to give 100% to the thing that he's doing and the chips are going to fall where they fall. You know what I mean? So I just like, yeah. and he's also incredibly funny. He's got yeah. such a great face. Like he's just such a good performer. So he's always been a guy. Yeah. Yeah. I know you're a big Boardwalk fan. You, I always yeah, I love Boardwalk. Boardwalk, he was great in that. And he is really funny. It's a, uh, and he seems like we met him at a couple of those HBO events. Like yeah. he was always friendly and personable. And I think he's like a real fireman, wasn't he? Yeah, I think he came up as a fireman in Brooklyn. And I think still kind of like volunteers. And like yeah. after 9-11, like after 9-11, it was a big thing. He went back and like helped do cleanups and help support firemen in New York City. But yeah, like I think yeah. there's, uh, the, don't quote me on this. I think there's a possibility that, um, uh, that he like comes from a family of firemen. I feel like there are firemen in his family. Ask Chat GPT the question, the answer to that one, because I don't know for sure. Um, okay. My friend Willie used to live in uh, in Buscemi's neighborhood in Brooklyn, and he would always like see him getting bagel. He would like always report to like, because me and my friends all loved him too. Like 
Uh, he would always report to us. Like I saw, I was in the same bagel shop as Buscemi today. It seemed like he was doing good. And like one time he like saw him saying goodbye to his grandma and he was like, okay, okay, grandma, I'll see you later. I'll see you later. You know what I mean? <laughs> like that was a big day for us. That's, that's pretty good inside scoop. I like that. All right. So we got this one is from the email uh, from Martin Royal, Martin Royale or Martin Royal, uh, who hails from New Hampshire. A lot of people, it was great. A lot of people put in where they were from for your benefit. I love that. We got to get the map with the push pins. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, I always find I want to paraphrase this one a little bit. Um, oh, so this person, I think ultimately the question is uh, uh, about season seven, where he says that he loves that... Uh, a character who is constantly made fun of uh, in Mike is the only one who actually succeeds in media and politics because in season seven, you have this pivot to being like just fully on the media side. And you ultimately are like, you know, the C CBS news uh, anchor. Yeah. Um, I, and he, so his question is, or his disappointment is that he wished he got to see more Mike and Wendy in the final season. And I think the question is, do you have any idea of like in your heads or uh, like whatever happened to Mike and Wendy? Do you think they're still together? How do you think they're doing? Oh, like fan fiction if I had to. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's something funny about them like taking on another business that kills them financially like alpacas. And then there's a blight of like <laughs> mites or some kind of thing that eats the fur on the alpacas which is what you want from them. You want that wool so you can make the sweaters and then there's some kind of bug that infects their their wool and then they lose all their money. So I imagine they're at a farm in like Maryland or Virginia and they are probably recovering from some investment like alpacas and, uh, and the kids are growing and there's probably like some, uh, there'd be an amazing like, Maybe one of their kids had like, like make it, I would write it like Mike and Wendy, you know, went to the Bahamas or Mike won a sweepstakes. You know how you can win a sweepstakes? <laughs> like a, a three day, four, three night, four day in the Bahamas. And then one of his kids is old enough and they had a rave that they sold tickets to and like two kids almost died. So when they got home, there was like, you know, their, their whole farm was like trashed and there were still porta potties there. You know what I mean? <laughs> I think that would be a good uh, fiction for that. I love that because actually there was a question from Instagram that was actually along the same lines, like whatever happened to whatever happened to Mike and Wendy's kids. That was like your step, like uh, whatever happened to them. So I love that that's a part of it too. I think they're, I think they are referring to like the stepsons that we see in like yeah. three. Wendy's kids, right? Wendy's kids. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of children running. Not the, ones who were adopted i think or not the surrogate right the surrogate yeah, the I surrogate how, i should Just know how many kids like wendy had two boys right you met them right Jonah yeah. came up and met them and then i think he adopted three or they had two adopted adopted. one and he had twins through the surrogate thank you so then he has five kids sort of in, the, in their family yeah all right yeah cool. great question thank you that is a great question Martin um, Powell from Uncle Jeff's New Hampshire. Uh, this is from the internet, chat GPT. Um, outside of Jonah Ryan, is there a character you've played that holds a special place in your heart? Ooh, good question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank GPT. you Mr. Uh, GPT. Um, a uh, character that I hold a special place in my heart. Uh, yeah, no, for sure. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, oh, you know, I it came up recently. I was in a movie called Christine. Well, any movie um, that I uh, that I just I was thinking about it recently because I I worked with one of the guys who did like the set decoration. I saw like the set decorator of that movie recently, um, and that one just kind of felt special. It was like so indie. I think the budget was like just over a million dollars like you know 
the hotel that we all stayed in in Savannah was like, I, I'm 100% positive people have been murdered in that hotel. Um, <laughs> you know, like nothing, like the building that we shot in was going to be torn down, like fully condemned as soon as we left. And and so they kind of just got to build this whole television studio in it, studio in it. And I just, it was a really great, like group of actors the director was a guy named antonio it was like it was a really cool job and it felt like it was like a very sort of family feeling job we just hung out with each other all day you know in like this on air conditioned georgia summer uh uh set and it was awesome and i just i he was a weatherman for like a small local uh ah. florida like a florida news channel i don't know i like really liked the vibe of that one um, oh, that's fun to play a weatherman. I think that's a great role to play. Yeah. Yeah. And it turns out the real guy that it was based off of was, I believe, uh, it's been a little while since I did this research. So if I'm wrong, chat GPT will tell me that he was one of the first guys in the country to do the weather in the weather. Like he was the guy who, oh. like if it was raining, he would go outside and be like, yeah, it's raining out. You know what I mean? If it was windy, he you know, sunny day, he'd like go up on the radio tower to show everybody. So doing the weather in the weather is, I think, something that everybody just assumes has always been done. But he was like one of the first people to do it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that, they, that's a staple on the weather channel. Oh, my God. They, they love to get their people in the hurricanes. Oh, they love it. They're like, OK, yeah. do the thing where you're like, you, you know, the building's blocking the wind, but you have to take two steps back and they get knocked over. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, this is from, uh, someone on Instagram, Colcon 20. Uh, what was your favorite scene of each other's that you didn't share together? I have a good answer for yours. Read it again. I'm sorry, please. Uh, what was your favorite scene of each other's that you didn't share? So like a scene that we weren't in together that you just watch and you really like. I feel like. I have a couple broad answers. I can't think of a like. I think it was in season six where you get elected Congress, or is that season five? That's season five. Yeah, I feel like five and six together are just great seasons for Jonah. He really like MVP stuff, like so funny, and so I love that all that Jonah run of like when he has success and he's actually corralling congressman and they're forced to listen to his dumb ideas and they need his vote and he gets to ruin selena's chances by abstaining like all that stuff was just fantastic and and then you know being around jeff uncle jeff i never got to do a scene with peter oh yeah and so i really love that character like you you do he's so funny and i always like wish that i could have met him in our fictional world yeah mine one that really comes to mind for you is in uh full disclosure when you are in charge of all the redacting mm -hmm. and there's this one scene where you're like if you're having trouble doing the icdn number redacting let me know and i will help you with the icdn number redacting like that <laughs> number one that line specifically lives rent free in my head i love it but just that whole thing of like you being up all night somebody like you drop something and somebody steps over you i yeah just, i loved i loved that early version of mike you know what i mean and uh i mean like but it does i mean like i also love the scene where you're like uh pay me bitch and you're fucking smashing <laughs> like when you're both drunk and you're smashing yeah. the barn like that, that is like that is you know, those are like the two things that like the those are like the two wolves that live inside of Mike. You have like the Mike who can do the ICDN number redacting joke, and you also have the Mike that can do the pay me bitch or like why do you always keep eating when you're full like that? <laughs> you're a grown man. You're a grown man. I mean, it's all incredible. So those are two. Those are two that come to mind. You know, and it's funny because the ICDN redacting line. That isn't a joke. It's not structured no. as a joke. That's one of those things that's like 
we talk about like people think is funnier than when you read it. It's like, yeah, I don't understand why that's funny, but people for some reason find that funny. Um, all right, here's one. How do you see, how do you think the landscape of comedy has changed over the past decade and where do you see it heading? Oh God, I don't want to answer that. All right, that's fine. I'll give you another one. Um, do you have any hidden talents or hobbies that fans might be surprised to learn about? I got to hand it to chat GPT giving just mm -hmm. absolute mo like blandest most what are your hobbies and interests oh yeah no this is definitely going to replace us um <laughs> do you enjoy eating food and drinking water um well, well we know uh, golf i know you're a golfer but the fans yeah. probably the fans probably know you're a golfer if they listen to our fans podcast. probably know i'm a golfer but is there uh and they know about your organized dvd collection blu-ray yes, collection. they know about that we covered that um, you know, maybe just because I had to help out with uh, the strike and it, it is very clear that I think Marty's going to be doing more of these plays. And I think it came up like that. I, I used to be a set carpenter. Oh, I have an interest in, in woodworking, although I'm not very good at it. So I would say that would be like a very simple answer to that question. I don't think I'm very good at it, but I have an interest in, in woodworking and I would like to get to do some more finished carpentry. You need to become buddies with Nick. What's his name? With Offerman, yeah. Yeah, he's got his wood shop in L.A. Yeah, I think it might even be pretty close by here. I'm sure he would let you in. You're a fellow comedian and someone who cares about craftsmanship. And also a Chicagoan or spent time in Chicago. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm sure he'd be delighted if you showed interest. Um, I You know, I did actually at one point, um, I did at one point, say something about like oh does anybody know about a wood shop in la and somebody like connected me with him on twitter and uh and this was like last year and we like dm'd a couple times and weirdly for however many like mutual friends mutual co-workers because we had the like we worked with the entire good place and like parks and rec crew crew and morgan sackett knows him uh i have never met him even in passing and uh anyway we dm'd a few times be like oh i would love to check out the place and then i got locked out of twitter and uh his phone number was in there and i've never so since then i have never been able to like maybe he listens to the show and if he does uh find a different way to reach out so, i doubt he listens to the show very much i don't know it'd be pretty great i doubt it i doubt yeah, very much doesn't. I doubt very much he listens to our show, but we can make that connect. We'll make that connection. I run into him every rare once in a while. All right. So this is a detail one that comes from Brittany White on Instagram. Um, where does she, she live? Hmm? Does she say where she lives? Yeah. She says, uh, well, I'm wondering, you know what? She's. I'm just going to say Ohio only because we gave her full name. And I feel like if we give her town... Right. This like then that's going to end up being like just like identity theft. Somebody's just going to be like, oh, I have heard those four pieces of information, and now I have her social security number. Okay. Uh, so uh, if we, uh, she said, and this is sort of an, a a mea culpa because I forgot to bring this up when we were recording Cuntgate, that um, uh, her favorite scene in the series, uh is when Charlie is dumping Selena in the bookstore. The main display of the best of the what is clearly a bestseller is monica's book oh so Monty, like Monty, the you know yeah. the, uh pop cornaments uh yeah. selena's book from season three is on deep discount <laughs> <laughs> and immediately behind her are quote liar in chief books at, like liar in chief and other anti-selena books so I had never noticed that, that wow. Monty's book is a bestseller. Hers is on deep discount. And there is like a big section of anti Selena Meyer books on the shelves behind her. Which means the art department made those book covers. Yes. Oh, that's delicious. So that's like season three, you're saying? That would be the Charlie Richard? Richard breakup. Charlie Baird. That's oh, that's two. five, right? At five? I think it's five. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because she's still in power. She has the ability to uh, uh, to decide who's getting bailed out. So that's not yeah. the presidency. She's yeah. And Tom James is part of that episode too. Yeah. Because he's running. He's the minister of finance or what? Or economic. He gets the czar. He gets that job. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she also good. points out that when the door, the plane, when uh, when Karen gets out of the plane, and I think for the Arizona stuff, it's on like a a, a Meyer James for president, or maybe it's like a campaign plane jet, campaign jet. Yeah, campaign jet. And she says uh, when it's close on her, it says only James for president with just his face. And she was wondering if there might be some foreshadowing to that. That to me seems less like it, like less intentional than the book, than the bookshelves. That just seems like sort of like almost like accidental foreshadowing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the way they framed it. Yeah. 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 But it's also just sliding. He was always overshadowing her the minute he came on the scene uh -huh. that was their whole relationship he always people liked him more so it's it's in keeping with that of like noticing his name more on the plane or whatever is probably very much in keeping with that yeah um a couple things one someone listened to that show that we did with andy where we talked about the four or five sitcom endings from the 80s like elf oh Diamond yeah Ford. They said it was a great episode. So we got some uh, listeners who heard us on another media or another show. Oh, is, great. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. They were big fans of it. Um, and then this just popped up from Chap GPT, which is, what are some of your all-time favorite comedy films or TV shows? Wow. God, Chat GPT, what an amazing tool. Um, because you can really tell the personality behind the question. You know what I mean? Is you can like <laughs> really tell you when... know what chat GPT's interests are. Yes. Yeah. You can just tell that they care. It, yeah. That there is like there's passion behind that question. And that's what I really appreciate. Yeah. Um, uh favorite comedies. Well, they're gonna go all-time favorite, which I'll just point that out. All-time favorite. Comedy film or TV show? Maybe you could name one or two of those. Um, I go with Four Lions. I put Four Lions up there. Wow. Yeah. Oh. I think that's I mean, like I think if I like really went back to the if I went to the the shelves and like went through, I think I would be there might be some that like maybe I uh were released when I was maybe uh, sorry, maybe more influential, like in my upbringing. But I feel like Four Lions is just as many times as I've watched it. I don't know that it's ever been anything but like a 10 out of 10. That's a great answer. ChatGPT really does get good conversation out of you. I feel like we should just like ChatGPT to do the shows from <laughs> now on. <laughs> I love it. I uh, I don't know that I can. I always hate those questions like what's your favorite TV show of all time or what's your favorite like. Yeah. I can't even. Pressure. It is, and it's yeah. But Four Lions is a great movie, hands down. Um, do you want to be answering any of these Chat GPT questions? I'll answer one next. I'll I'll find one off the the list and. Okay, you have to make sure you go back to the prompt and say I have an opportunity to inter interview Matt Walsh today. Oh, I could do that. I'll change the yeah, prompt. and then see see what it comes up with. Um. So let me find, oh, let me find our next one. I'll go back to the emails. Um, oh, this is just like a comment from Lauren. I don't know where she's from. I, I, she has recently been diagnosed with uh, a fructose intolerance. Wow. Yeah. Joke about that. And Sorry. It does definitely sound fake is what she said. And also the test that you have to take for uh, to discover if you're if you have like a fructose intolerance or a fructose intolerance uh, also sounds fake. You have to go to the doctor so they can look at a bunch of your breath, like specific breath. You give them 
this specific breath by drinking one special liquid and blowing into a syringe. You do this every half hour for six hours one day and six the next day. The special breath then tells them what is amiss virtually immediately. Well, not immediately. Two days, six hours yeah, each. Two days later. Two days later. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's arduous. That's a lot of work. Oh, and this is, a, I think, just another comment. Um, this is another comment. Uh, given the regular discussion of the from David Hennigar, uh, given the regular discussion of the quality of the episode synopsis used for the podcast, the for, uh, for the final season's episodes, you may wish to consider inviting fans to record and submit synopses for use when rewatching season seven. I think that's a phenomenal idea. Well, let's say it right here. If you guys are listening to this one, Tim and I for certain will be doing seven episodes of season seven. And if you want to just, do you want them to write it or audio it? I guess we don't have audio. audio. It. How do we get the audios? I think they can just email it to us. Just send us an audio file via email. And uh, you could be the voice of uh, our uh, episode synopsis because they really are lacking. We could do a couple, honestly, for God's sakes. Yeah, we could do all seven. Fuck it. If we get seven, we do all seven. Um, I just wanted to say something. I forgot to tell you what Chat GPT said when I said I'm gonna interview Tim Simons. I got any questions to inspire conversation. Huh? Chat GPT's first comment was that sounds like a fun interview. Oh, okay. So I just want you to know that. All right. And then when I said that, I, I told Chat GPT I'll be asking Matt Walsh. I'd like some questions to ask Matt Walsh. I'll be interviewing him. Chat GPT said. Great. Matt Walsh will be a fantastic interview. Oh, so that's I was going to be fun, but you're fantastic. Yeah. I don't know what's better. I don't think you have to compare. I mean, like, I'm just saying that that to me feels like chat GPT is, che is treating you like a two to a four. Really? Whereas I'm still in the three to nine. You know what I mean? I was worried that chat GPT would confuse me with conservative blogger, Matt Walsh. Oh, <laughs> and thank God it didn't. So kudos to you. Um, let's see. How did you, what was one of the most memorable moments for you while working on Veep? Any funny behind the scenes stories? That's, that's the, apparently, Apparently, it has not. ChatGPT does not know that we have been doing like a multi-year podcast about funny stories and behind the scenes. Yeah, maybe I'll go. Um, let's go to this one. Uh, how do you balance the demands of your career with your personal life? Hmm. Good question. <laughs> Jimmy Fallon would even ask that question. That's no. pretty, that's not a good one. Okay. Besides Mike McClintock, is there a role that you've played that is particularly meaningful to you? <laughs> you should just um, say, just give the answer I gave. You played a weatherman. I like playing a weatherman in this like Georgia <laughs> indie, but I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to Jet GPT. <laughs> if you could work with any actor or director, who would it be and why? I know who it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be David Fincher. I don't think I could survive a guy like that. That would really put me in my head. Yeah. Um, so if you're listening, David, uh, we're going to need to sit down if you're considering me for something because I just don't work that way. <laughs> um, and then as far as like actors... You know, you know, I think's funny, and obviously a movie star is uh, Ryan Gosling. Oh yeah, he's legit funny. Like he's like unfairly like gifted. You know, he's a gorgeous man, and he's also funny. It's like one of those people. Yeah, he gets to, he gets to be both. So he would be somebody that's fun to play with. And it also seems like if you're on a Gosling thing, it's probably a big deal. And you're probably going to, there can probably be like a lot of good perks to being on that production. Like you're probably going to get like a, like a really good quality backpack. You know what they mean? They're going to be like, Hey, we had these like backpacks made up for the production. Like every day you're going to be walking in. They're going to be like, Oh yeah. Like Yeti wanted to like, 
you know, give us like the, they made us these coolers and you're like, Oh my God, that's like a $500 cooler. And they're like, yeah, Yeti donated them. And they want right. product placement. Here's, I'm going to give you what I need as an actor to do a project. Okay. And uh -huh. you can, you can give me yours. Um, I need a room that's not by a highway where I can sleep. Mm -hmm. and I don't want to know about a bar that lets out in my neighborhood where I'm staying. Either it's an apartment. Uh, if it's a long stay, I want a kitchen. Yep. Okay. Uh, I prefer to drive to set. Honestly, I don't like getting driven. I feel, I always feel like obligated in some way. Like, I don't know. It feels subservient to need a driver. I don't, I don't like that relationship. I don't, but so if I had my preference, I'd like self-drive, and yeah, I'd like a nice basket and some wine when I land. I think that's a. I think that's the right move. I think you want to welcome your town. <laughs> and then I want access to the office where there's like goodies. You know, like yeah. I want to know if that's in my hotel or if that's in my apartment or if it's, you know, in in set where the wardrobe. You know, we do your fittings, whatever. I just want to know, like, and then neighborhood wise, I'd love like a Whole Foods. Or like, you know, I need walkable stuff. I don't want to be in a remote part of town. That's, but that's not high maintenance. Like that's pretty simple. Yeah. And then I want communication. I want to know like, guys, if I'm not working for 12 days, I'm going home. Like, and I want to know that the schedule's changed. I don't want to have to like monitor the production schedule and look at the new day out of days every week. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, I want to be a partner in this project. And creatively i want input i want to be able to work with the director and go can i say this or pitch jokes always pitch ideas always i want to be heard and i want to have a sit down with that director or the writer whoever runs the project and i want to give them my take on the character yeah that's sure. not a lot that's, that's not, not a, lot. a lot no and then maybe i mean a yeti or a stanley cup when you leave with your name yeah. on it and the project name that's great. But better than that, honestly, like a utility tool, fucking, I love anything I can use at home, like a emergency kit. One, one project I got like an emergency earthquake kit mm -hmm. that I still have. Like, that's amazing. I want functional stuff. Not a I got, I still, we got a wrap with some of the wrap gifts we've gotten from Veep. We got like a, one of those portable phone charger banks that was like branded with Veep. It had like Veep on it. You know what I mean? But it's like, you know, you charge I didn't it. get one. I didn't think yeah. I got one. Sorry, I think that was only for like one through uh one through seven on the call sheet. So sorry about that. I'll let you have the one that I, I got two. Um oh, got we got like one time we got like a real nice like to me. Oh yeah, still have that's that. still in rotation. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a workhorse, that one. That one's never gonna like, you know, we're giving like we're we're handing out free ads right now. To me suitcases, like they're expensive. I've never I've never bought one. They're incredibly that, expensive. That might have been a Julia gift, by the way. It might have been. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that that was a production gift, but uh, anything else you need from a project before we move on to another question? No, that pretty much covered it. Also, um, you know, two three million dollars. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, two three million dollars direct access uh, to Ryan Gosling. Uh, so that if he's like going out, he can always be like, Hey man, we're heading out. And I can be like, Oh man, I'm busy tonight. Just so it like throws him off balance. Like that's what I need. You know what I mean? <laughs> then I'll, I'll hang out the second time and he'll be like, Oh man, I thought he didn't like me. So anyway, it's all, you know, it's all pretty simple stuff. Oh, I love how you strategize. Yeah. It's important gotta... in interpersonal uh, relationships to make sure you strategize how, to best get the upper hand on their feeling. Like manipulation of feelings is really the best possible thing to do. Well, if you want to be memorable. I think this is a good one. I think we should end it on this. Um, Great. Only because I'm so tired. Um, and I'm going to go well, take- I minute. salute it. I, I'm in. I love it. Um, I've noticed that many in my faith. This is Peter. Oh, Peter from Helsinki. What? Yes. Peter from Helsinki. 
Well, we have a fan in South Africa, a guy named Ryan. I tr- he's a doctor. I turned him on to our podcast. We have a fan in South Africa now, Ryan. Oh, great. I did notice that there was one extra listen this week. Um, so Peter from Helsinki. How are the numbers? Are we are we still number one in South Korea? Are we still do have you checked the metrics? I haven't checked the metrics. I can only assume we're still number one in South Korea. Okay. I have okay. noticed that many of my favorite shows have Allison Jones as a casting director. And I was wondering, what do you guys think is the importance of a casting director in creating a successful show? And it would be great if you could have her as a guest. I think that's an amazing suggestion. We definitely, uh, once we get back to like the season seven uh, rotation, we should have Allison come in and talk about her process and the casting of the show. I love it. Yeah. She was one through four. She was one through four. Yeah. Five, maybe. She might have done five, too. Oh, she may know. have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. Well, my answer to that would be, I think what sets casting directors, you know, above and beyond the, the pack is an eye for talent that people don't know about yet. Mm-hmm. So you have to, like, Obviously, Tim Simons is a, is a known known. He's a commodity. So it doesn't take much wit or insight to read something and go, oh, Tim Simons would be great for this because you have a oeuvre of work that they can look at. Um, so you have to be able to find people that have not essentially caught their break yet. Yeah. And I think the way to do that is to see a lot of people and I think you have to talk to them in the room somehow, create a tiny relationship with them in, a, in that brief moment so that they are at their best and they feel like, oh, she likes me or they like me. That's my hot take. Yeah. Like, uh, how, how are you, how are you going to know? When they're like, hey, we'd love to hire Tim Simons for this, but we want to be able to we want to be able to pay him less. So who is like Tim Simons, but who hasn't caught a break so we can just not pay that person? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. As we're shooting this in South Africa as San Diego, and maybe there's a South African local that can do a pretty good Tim Simons without an accent. Yeah. And you just got to be dialed in. No, I think my answer to that, and I would love to hear more about, because I don't know the ins and outs of that. But I feel like one thing that you hear a lot is like, um, and it related to even how I got cast on the show was you have a description uh, of maybe a physical description and then, but your interpretation of a character or your interpretation of, of a script as a casting director can play in of like, I know they're looking for this one thing, but I'm also going to give them like, a few options that maybe don't fit exactly, but I feel like might also work. Here's something you might not be thinking of. And they're just going to show it to you. And it might not work. It might not be what they want. They might be like, yeah, no, that's really not it. But the ability, like, I feel like that's where a lot of the creativity comes in. Yeah. Like this, uh, this idea that uh, you don't have to be 99.9 percent beholden to exactly what the script says you can take your own little interpretations of it and that that can help really guide the the process and and honestly just possibly like elevate it you know you hear yeah. stories about that of like oh like this person was on nobody's radar for this movie but then but the casting director was like you know i think you know who i think might be great for this this person they were like oh that's a good idea like let's see him let's see him if that read works you know what i mean uh, yeah get him in the room get some chemistry yeah um all right i think that's the best we can do for memorial day let's go yeah. let's go celebrate the fallen heroes uh thank them for their service um thank you for service all of you Happy and uh And we'll go spend some time with our families. We'll make some smoothies. We'll feed some chickens. Uh, I did that already. We'll do it again. And, uh, or I guess maybe this is a reminder for the people that if you haven't fed your chickens, go feed your chickens. Uh, Yeah, or your children for that matter. Go feed your children. This has been uh, Second in Command of the Rewatch Podcast. My name is Timothy Simons. I play Jonah Ryan. I'm Matt Walsh. I play Mike McClintock. And uh, you did it with some more fervor.
on that one. I appreciate it. Just a teaser, just to kind of, for the listeners, we want some synopses coming our way for season seven. Yes. Uh, if you haven't checked out the book, start checking out the book because we're going to cover that in the next month is my suspicion. Don't yawn. I'm not that boring, Tim. And uh, what was my other point? Oh, we still have to do the movie Rad. By the way, my friend Robert, who loves that movie, I, uh -huh. I told you, yes. his mom and dad produced it. Really? Yeah, they were the producers. That's one reason why he loves it, too. I didn't realize it. Then I saw it. He had a screening. He releases it every year, once a year, and they call it Rad Day, and it's in a bunch of cinemas around the country. Hell yes. Okay, yeah. So we're going to be doing a Rad episode coming up. Um, oh, I'm so excited about this. Um all right. Well, that's it. Re review, subscribe. We're on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. All right. All right. That's it, guys. Stop record. Stop record. No, I have to push the button. You can't just say stop record. Oh, I can't audio, audio control. Oh. The show. Edit.